Ladies and gentlemen, in the red corner, hailing from the state of Nevada, representing the steam and wise guys, it's the always feared Vegas Odds Maker! And in the blue corner, the crowd favorite from South Florida, Mark Winning Picks Lawrence! And now, let's get it on! Against the spread, Winning Picks with Mark Lawrence! Hi everybody, welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence along with Victor King and we're all set to go against the spread on this week's College and Pro Football Cards. And Victor, we had to take a week out last week. It was our bye week, unfortunately, for some personal family reasons, but we're back in the saddle again this week. Looking forward to what will be an exciting week, I feel, in the world of college football with the conference championship games, not to mention the NFL as well. Well, right you are, Mark. And we apologize for canceling our podcast last week. Uh, we're back in action again this week. We are raring to go. The four-day Thanksgiving weekend was a lot of fun. Uh, as far as our big games go, somebody is on a really, really major big game hunt. And I'm talking about Mark Lawrence's late phone service. I got the numbers here in front of me, Mark. Just over the last four weeks in college football in the NFL, let me check this out here. Mark Lawrence, four-star best bet, Notre Dame, revenge game of the year, winner. The week after that, NFL revenge game of the year, Arizona Cardinals, also a winner. Same weekend, four-star best bet, Arkansas, a winner. Two weeks ago, we didn't talk about it on the podcast. There wasn't one last week. Mark had his 10-star college football, once-a-year game of the year on Arkansas. That was a winner. So was Baylor as a four-star best bet. And then finally, last weekend as well, the four-star best bet on Missouri on Black Friday. Nicely done. And then Mark had that five-star false favorite game of the year on Saturday in college football. A play on Oregon State. Didn't look good in the beginning, but what a furious comeback by the Beavers in the fourth quarter of that particular game. They beat Oregon outright. And Mark, according to my math, in the last four weeks, Mark Lawrence, four-star or better, college football and NFL best bets, seven wins, zero losses over the last four weeks. Talking about being on a big game hunt, beautifully played, well done. Mark's customers are very, very happy. But you know what, Mark? That's inconsequential right now. We want to thank all people on the podcast for sending along their texts, for their emails in regards to Mark and his personal situation. So, Mark, that's the question right now that most of the podcast viewers and listeners want to hear from you right now. If you got a minute, how are you getting through this very difficult 10 to 14 day period uh, in your life over the last two weeks? Well, I have to say, Victor, 7-0 and oh certainly helps, okay? <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, it was tough. It was really tough going back home to Cleveland, meeting with the family, doing all the necessary things, giving a eulogy, which is really difficult. But we're through all that. We're focused now on football, where we need to be. And you mentioned that five-star play on Oregon State last week. I mean, they came back out of the clouds somehow – scored the last 24 points of the football game and won the money and got the money as well. And I told my wife, Colleen, I said, I think we had some divine intervention in that football game. <laughs> could be. Could very well be. Yeah, could, could well have been. But So we're getting by just fine, and I want to thank all of our listeners out there uh, and viewers and everybody that has visited with us via email for all your thanks, your warm thoughts. They really, really mean a lot to me, and they keep me going. So thank you so much. Sounds good, Mark. Let's head to our college football segment. What do you say? I'm all for it, Victor. We got uh, not only what we got on tap this week, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, a big weekend of college football conference games. You know, that means we're getting to the penultimate week of the football season. The only reason it's not the final week of the season is because Army and Navy are, still have to play next week. But nonetheless, this is going to set the table for the college football bowl games and the football playoffs, most importantly of all. And, Victor, with that thought in mind, I have to ask you this. Right now, it appears that we're going to have at least one and possibly two 
one lost teams in the college football playoff. What is your feeling? And, and that, those would come from obviously Oregon and U, USC if they happen to make that, or even Ohio State. I should say Oregon. I should say Ohio State and USC. So what happens if Florida, I mean, I should say LSU, takes out Georgia, wins the Southeast Conference with two losses? Do we see a two-loss team in the college football playoff? That's what I have to ask you. Well, you are talking about a scenario here that could potentially come into play. Could Alabama sneak back in uh, with a two-loss season or Tennessee or even a Penn State team or maybe even a Clemson team? Personally, uh, I'd have to hold my nose a little bit to see a two-loss team in the Final Four. But I'll tell you this, it makes a very good case that we should definitely have an expanded playoff, maybe an eight-teamer, maybe even a 12-teamer or a 16-teamer, because we could definitely answer some of those questions if the playoff had some more teams in it, Mark. Well, you know, a, a good friend of ours, a uh, longtime follower of our work, Brett McMurphy, uh, you can follow him at Brett underscore McMurphy. He works for the Action Network, and he's their college football guru. And he tweets a lot of great stuff. And one of the things he tweeted was what would be the proposed 12-team playoff if we're happening this year. And I got to tell you something, Victor. It would look awfully inviting to see these four teams get their buys, the four top-seeded teams get their buys, and then look at their football teams that are playing just for the right to get into the playoff against those guys. It would be very, very appealing. We wouldn't even be having this conversation about two lost teams because it would be pretty well filled, at least half of them with two loss, two losses in the football season. So that's probably a story for another day, perhaps next year. But uh, I got to say, I'm one of these guys that's really excited about expanding the playoffs. Yeah, definitely, Mark. Uh, with that, uh, I've got uh, a couple of trends out of the database that we can throw out there in regards to the championship games. Now, I don't... Uh, I don't value trends as much as some other betters out there. I think in a lot of cases, they're just usually noise. But you also have to keep in mind that betting markets will adjust over time to any identifiable profitable trends. That said, though, I do find them interesting at the minimum for uh, the one-off unique events like conference championships. And here's a quick little summary of some of the tidbits that I dug up pertaining to some of the sides and the totals. And number one, it starts with barking underdogs. Uh, in all conference championships, we're dating back to 2005. Underdogs have gone a profitable 63, 54, and 3. That's 54% ATS. However, it's not the neutral site dogs that have uh, been the most profitable. It's true home dogs or true road dogs who have performed much better at 24 and 14 ATS, 63%. And in regards to perhaps conference-specific trends, the MAC conference has seen their puppies cash at the highest rate of all conferences at 12, 4, and 1 ATS, while the ACC comes in at the lowest. Their dogs have only gone 7 and 10 ATS. Also, Unranked underdogs have enjoyed quite a bit of success against ranked teams in those conference title games. They've gone 70% ATS in that same time period, 14 and 6. Uh, even more significant, they've covered by an average of more than 10 points per game. And this year, there are two of them that fit that mold. They are North Texas and Purdue. Uh, also, we don't want to overreact too much, Mark. You know, underdogs that fail to cover multiple games in a row have actually gone 82% against the spread in their conference championship. Yeah. They have covered by a gaudy average of plus 11 points per game. That trend applies to, again, North Texas this week and finally North Carolina. And conversely, conference title favorites that have covered multiple games in a row have gone just one and 10 ATS against underdogs on multiple game ATS losing streaks. And this unfavorable one and 10 trend applies to 
Tulane this week in the AAC championship. And final, in regards to some of the totals, uh, since 2005, there has been conference championship games. There's been 60 overs. There's been 59 unders. Wow. We're basically split right down the middle. Uh, that's probably pretty much what you expect, especially with closing totals getting even more efficient mm-hmm. later in the season. For what it's worth, the Mountain West and the Big 12 have been the best under results in conference championships in the Mountain West, their games have gone two overs, seven unders in their championship game over the last nine years. And the Big 12 has gone four overs, 12 unders in the last 16 Big 12 championships, indicating a slight lean on the under with TCU hosting Kansas State this week. And finally, we've got one conference in which the over has been a fantastic play in their conference championship games. But I'm going to hold on to that one until we get to our college football game of the week, Mark. Oh, Victor, I can't wait to hear that. That's good news. Stay tuned, listeners. Victor's holding on to a big one in a college football conference championship game. And by the way, our good friend Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas is listening to the show as we're doing it. And he texted me to correct me. And he mentioned that LSU is a three-loss team, not a two-loss team. Nine and three. So God forbid what happens if LSU takes out Georgia, wins the Southeast Conference, does not make the playoff, but Alabama and or Georgia go instead. You talk about controversy, it may happen in the Southeast Conference. We're gonna, in fact, we're gonna tear that game apart, that Georgia LSU game in just a little bit for our featured conference game of the week this particular week. You're listening in to Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. I'm visiting with Victor King from King Creole Sports. And Victor, what do you say? Let's go over to the National Football League side of things where things are getting a little bit, a little bit under the tight end of the collar here for some of these football teams that are have playoff thoughts in their minds, but uh, perhaps aren't performing like they should be. Uh, I'll talk about who's in and who's out right now currently in the National Football League playoff race. But one thing that we do in this segment here, Victor, is we usually visit with our or a note from our good friend, uh, the Texas Tornado in Dallas, Texas, who reminds us each week of a most embarrassed team in the National Football League. And these are generally motivated football teams because they were red-faced and embarrassed in their last football contest. I'm going to ask you, Victor, I looked up and down, it was a little tough for me, but I'm going to ask you, who do you nominate for your most embarrassed team in the NFL this week? Well, our buddy Steve, the Texas Tornado, has nominated the Indianapolis Colts, who lost on Monday against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, I don't think that's that particular game was as much of a surprise to some of the sharp betters as one would normally think, given Mike Tomlin's great record as an underdog. Pittsburgh won that game outright on Monday night, what, 24 to 17. But let me throw someone out, a team out there, and it is the Seattle Seahawks. They were favored by more than a field goal at home against the Las Vegas Raiders in the Sunday late afternoon kickoffs. And the host Seahawks, they picked off Derek Carr on the very first play of the game and scored a touchdown in the first 20 seconds to take a 7-0 lead. But aside from that, they could not stop the Raiders on offense at all, all game long. They gave up, what, 293 passing yards, 283 rushing yards. They got outstanding by more than 200 yards at home, 576 to 372. They allowed an embarrassing 86-yard rushing to TD to Josh Jacobs with four minutes left in overtime to lose the game outright. They fell to 6-5 and straight up on the year. That's my most embarrassed team, Mark. Um, Can can you come up with any NFL teams who you think should be red-faced this week? Well, I know of a team that absolutely should be red-faced this week, Victor, and it's not based on what they did last week. It's based on their overall body of work the last two weeks. And simply put, hands down, there is no worse team in the National Football League these days than the Houston Texans. And the reason I say that is you go back and you look at them, in the first half of their last two football games, they've been outscored 50 to nothing. In the first half of those football games, they were outyarded 533 to 37 yards. I said that right, 533 to 37 yards. 
That's in a full half or a half and a half. Add them, add them together here. That's a full game, 533 to 37 yards. In first downs, they've been out first down 33 to 4. And just coincidentally, if they happen to fire Lovey Smith, of which you know the fans are demanding because of the record, somebody's head has to swirl in a situation like this. I know management doesn't want to have to fire him because if they do, they will then have their fifth head coach in the last four years at Houston. What a mess that's going on with that program. Victor, I think the only thing that could be worse is if Deshaun Watson were their quarterback this week. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> and, you know, speaking of the week 13 NFL schedule, Mark, I have not seen a good a week as this one in terms of matchups all season long. We've got some fantastic games. Chiefs, Bengals, Dolphins heading out west to take on the 49ers in what should be a true barometer game for our uh, South Florida boys here. Uh, the Titans and the Eagles, uh, a game featuring what a one-loss Eagle team against a four-loss Titan team. Bills, Patriots, a big Thursday night game. How about Jets and Vikings? Two more winning teams taking on each other, as is a good division matchup. Washington Commanders against New York Giants. It's as good of a schedule as I've seen all year long. Uh, one thing we're going to stay away from for the time being is San Francisco 49er over the totals. If you see what they have done in the second half of their last four games, they've allowed zero points on defense in each wow. of the last four games. For that reason alone, it's, we're going to stay away from the 49er overs for the time being. And you know what else, Mark, I thought was shocking was the fact that the uh, – TV ratings for the Thanksgiving Day games were outstanding. 42 million people tuned in to watch the game on Fox between the Cowboys and the Giants. It ranks now as the most watched regular season game for any network. Uh, fantastic TV ratings. I think that probably was a culmination, Victor, of a couple of things. Number one, Dallas always gets their following every Thanksgiving. But the New York Giants are suddenly a winning team this football season. So they're gaining a lot of following from the East, from New York, from New Jersey, from Philadelphia, everywhere. So the combination of those two and the excitement about the National Football League, I think the fans really can't get enough of the NFL these days. And that's sad about San Francisco. That's almost Houston Texan-esque, if yep. you will, <laughs> in reverse <laughs> about San Francisco. You've got to keep that in mind talking about getting in their over-under totals, how stiff their defense has really been so far. Let's take a look at the playoff picture as we go into this particular week, as we always do with an update. If the playoffs were to begin this week, the number one seeds, once again, Kansas City and Philadelphia. Number two, the Miami Dolphins and the Minnesota Vikings. Your number three seeds would be the Tennessee Titans and the San Francisco 49ers, followed by number four, Baltimore and Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay, by default, a losing record, but still leading their division, nonetheless. Number five seeds, the Buffalo Bills and the Dallas Cowboys, followed by number six, Cincinnati and the New York Giants. And wrapping it up, number seven, the Jets and Washington, with New England and Seattle just on the outside looking in. So keep those teams in mind when you're going to handicap your games this particular football weekend. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. And Victor, let's move back to the college football side of things this week for our featured college football game of the week. And we've got a beauty on tap. We talked about it a little bit earlier on in the show in the Southeast Conference where the Georgia Bulldogs, the number one ranked team in every poll in America, takes on the three loss LSU Tigers. Victor, how do you see this showdown taking place between these two Southeast Conference champions? Four o'clock Eastern is our uh, kickoff time, uh, one o'clock Pacific time. Of course, they'll be playing in the controlled indoor environment of the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia. That has, of course, been the case now for a few years now in the SEC uh, championship game. Uh, in terms of the point spread, we've got Georgia. They opened up at about a 15-point favorite the last time we looked they're up to 17 and a half. There's even a couple of 18s out there. That's a lot of points in a conference championship game. And the over underline opened at 49 and a half. It's getting a little bit of a run on the over. As the last time I looked, it was up to 51.0. 
First off, in regards to this uh, series between the two teams, between Georgia and LSU, we will note that the last nine meetings have gone seven overs, only two unders. Uh, average combined points per game, 58.5. On the LSU side, you got a solid offense now, 32.5 points per game on the season. But a pretty good uh, defense as well, allowing only 21.5. On the Georgia side of things, 38.3 on offense, the number one scoring defense in all of college football this season. That's the Bulldogs. They are allowing only 11.3 points per game. In terms of each team's over-under records on the year, LSU pretty much split right down the middle, 6-6 six and six over-under. That includes 57 combined points per game in their home games, 51 in their road games. They started the season 1-5 and five over under in their first six games, but we will note their last six games have actually been completely flip-flopped. They've gone 5-1 and one over under in their last six games. Georgia, heck, the great scoring defense. It's no surprise that they are a very good under team on the season. They've gone 4-8 and eight over under on the season, 48.6 at home, 47.3 on the road. Uh, similar MO to LSU in regards to Georgia. They went one and six over under to start the season in their first seven games. And they have gone actually three and two over under in their last five. Now, uh, what is interesting about this game is when I was reading Mark's write up in our playbook football newsletter, and again, don't forget, here it is, folks. College football looking good as far as the best bets. This week's Playbook Football newsletter available, of course, at the PlaybookSports.com website. But I like your write-up in regards to this game, the fact that George has fallen off a little bit on offense as of late. I think Mark mentioned that in their first eight games of the season, they were reeling off 520 offensive yards per game, and in their last four it's actually about 120 yards less, only 405 yards per game. Is that significant? We'll we'll definitely see. Uh, we've got two very efficient quarterbacks who are both seniors. Uh, if you're an over better, you got to kind of like that. You got senior Jaden Daniels of LSU. You got senior Stetson Bennett of the Bulldogs. Uh, what I will say, Mark, is that with both teams trending over as of late. That is the way we're going to lean in this particular game. But remember, the optimum over underline, you're going to want to get in at 51.0 or less points because 51 is a key number in college football. So, again, if you can find a line of 51 or less, uh, we'll take a little taste of the over. Not only that, the SEC championship game has been the best over situation in all conference championships in the last 15 years. Going 12, 4, and 1, that's 75% over the total. That's the one that we teased you at at the beginning of the show. And these games have averaged 58.2 combined points per game. Uh, our database models point to a final score somewhere in the area of like 38 to 28, 38 to 27, somewhere in the low 60s. We think there's a little bit of value, and that's the way we'll look in the SEC championship game this week. Victor likes that SEC championship game total trend to continue. He goes over the total, 51 points, for a selection in the SEC title game. Taking a look at the Georgia Bulldogs, the number one ranked team across the board in every poll, and rightfully so this football season, the defending national champions. Unbelievably, they're the team with revenge in this particular series. And the reason they have revenge, the last time they met LSU, was in the 2019 SEC championship game when a guy named Joe Burrow and the LSU Bengals put a whooping on the Georgia Bulldogs, okay? And they went on to win the national championship. They did just that. That's how good they were. But anyway, inside this series, when Georgia has had the revenge, the five times, the last time, five times they've had it, they have not covered a ticket in any of those five. They're 0-4-1 against the spread and only one straight-up win. So having revenge and extracting it are two different things, especially inside this series. The series here is, again, I mentioned 4-0-1 to the spread for LSU, the last five overall games. And I think in particular what we have to focus in is the head coach here, 
Brian Kelly, who does a masterful job as an underdog in his career, especially off a loss. He's 18 and seven to the spread. The 25 times he's been an underdog when his teams are coming off losses. And the better the opponent, the better the result for Kelly. 11 and three to the spread when that opponent carries a 700 or better winning percentage. Victor talked about dogs or, or teams, I should say, coming into the conference championship games off a loss. Well, the combination of those two fits really well here because in championship games, dogs off a loss are 14 and six to the spread, including six and one the last seven over the past four years. Victor hit on it. He stole my thunder with my closing statement <laughs> about the Georgia Bulldogs and how they've regressed over the last four games as opposed to the way they opened the season their first eight. But that's all a direct result of the news getting tighter on the Georgia Bulldogs. The deeper they go, the more focus is on the Georgia Bulldogs. And this, remember, this is a defending national champion now that hasn't tasted defeat in two years here. I think the news gets really tight in this football game, especially when now LSU, a three-loss team, does Georgia play down to their level in this game? I'm not sure, but I know one thing for sure. I'll take the points with LSU in this contest. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show, along with Victor King from King Creole Sports. Let's go over to the National Football League side of things this week. And, Victor, you mentioned it. A great week on tap in the National Football League. The truth be known, the last two, three, maybe even four weeks, the cards have been rather thin in the National Football League. But, boy, they made up for it this particular week. Right. As you mentioned, this looks like playoff week, if you will, in the National Football League. And we're going to talk about two teams that right now would be in the playoffs, and they'd be highly seated in the playoffs when Philadelphia takes on Tennessee this particular week, that's our featured NFL game of the week. I'm going to turn over to Victor for his over-under take in this contest. Right, Eagles hosting the Tennessee Titans. Um, what Philadelphia opened up about a touchdown favorite. Uh, there has been apparently some uh, sharp action coming in on the underdog. They're down to five and a half. So the line has come down a point and a half, uh, maybe even two full points. In terms of the over-under line, it opened at 45, and the first initial move has come down a half. It's 44 and a half as we record the podcast here on Wednesday afternoon. And we are right on the cusp of two key numbers in the NFL when you have a line of 44 and a half. Those key numbers being 44 and 45. Those two numbers come up a lot in regards to the NFL Final scores and 44 and a half is a good number to look for. The Tennessee Titans, I mean, heck, they're one of the best under teams of the season in the NFL. Everybody knows that. They've gone three and eight over under, only 19.9 points per game on offense. Uh, great defense, allowing only 18.6. So the average Tennessee game has only hit 38.5 points per game on the season. It is no surprise that they are the number four under team in the NFL. The only uh, three teams who have a higher under percentage, Denver Broncos, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and Indianapolis Colts. And in the, uh, fact, in their last eight games, the Tennessee Titans have gone one and seven over under. With that said, I think we can make a decent case for a slightly higher scoring game than people think. Let's look at the Eagles, seven and four over under on the season. They're averaging 27.5. They're allowing 19.6. So Philadelphia games, 47.1 is their average. Not only that, but they are tied for the best home over record in the season in the NFL. They've got in, the, in their six home games, five overs, only one under. That's tied with the Cleveland Browns. Philadelphia home games have averaged 49.7. That's almost a full touchdown higher than their road games on the season. Now, uh, based on the spread and the over-under line, the implied score is Philadelphia 25.5, Tennessee 19. That's what the implied score is based on those two criteria. So the fact is, what we're asking, is Tennessee going to allow more than 20 points in this game? 
Well, I don't know. They have not allowed more than 20 in each of their last eight games with that stifling defense. However, what I will say is, after taking a look at our database, when Tennessee does allow more than 20 points in a game, they've gone 28-5-1 and one over under in the last five years. When Philadelphia does indeed score more than 20 points in a game, They've gone 15 and three to the over in the last two years. So again, you're asking yourself, will Philly eclipse 20 points in this game? I think they will. Again, they're averaging 27.5 in the season. Their implied uh, score is 25.5 in this particular game. Uh, not only that, but Tennessee, a great under team at home, a great under team as a favorite. But with that said, Tennessee's best over results have been on the non-division road. And in fact, in the last four years, the Titans have gone 9-1-1 one and one on the road as non-division road dogs of a touchdown or less. Uh, one more thing, Mark, from our rushing database. Philadelphia is ranked number two in rushing yards per game this season, 162.5. You see what they did in that Sunday night game against the Packers when they ran roughshod against Green Bay. Unbelievable numbers. 4.8 yards per rush on the season for the Eagles. With that said, Tennessee has an outstanding rush-stuffing defense. They allow only 83 yards uh, per game on the ground this season, only 3.9 yards per rush. When inputting those stats into our database, Mark, I got a strong over number, 17-3-1 and one over under last eight years. Game four or greater, non-division home favorites of less than 10 points who rush for 4.8 or greater yards per carry. That's Philly taking on any opponent who allows less than 4.0 yards per carry. That applies to the Tennessee Titans who are allowing only 3.9. So to fight the fact you got a great rush defense taking on a great rush offense, the database is saying play those games over the total. And not only that, but for that very same reason, Mark, we should see a lot of more uh, passing yards than expected in this game. After all, Tennessee has got a very, very susceptible passing defense. Cincinnati showed it last week. They're ranked second last in the league, right after the Minnesota Vikings, allowing 267 passing yards per game. Unexpected passing yards in this particular one. The clincher in non-conference games so far this season, when an NFC team is favored at home against an AFC team, 11 overs, only three unders. That's a 79% over situation. And as long as we are at 44 and a half mark, we'll take a look at this game over the total. We got some good numbers behind us. Again, follow the line move. Make your move at anything under 45 points. Victor likes this total to go over the total, 44 and a half being the ideal number between the Eagles and the Titans when they kick off in what might be, who knows, a potential Super Bowl matchup. That remains to be seen, but at least the two teams we know are indeed playoff contenders. Take a look at the Philadelphia Eagles coming into the contest. And as Victor mentioned last week, they just ran the snot out of the football. 363 rushing guard yards their last game, 153 in the first quarter. That's unbelievable, the numbers they put up here. They're off of their highest scoring production of the season and their most yards gained this season in that effort last week. What Philadelphia isn't, though, is any good when they're coming off a point spread win and their opponents off a point spread loss. You merge those two together, Philadelphia's just 1-8 and eight to the spread the last nine times that, that collision has happened. Check out the Tennessee Titans coming in here. I think what works for them is their third-ranked rush defense. They're allowing only 85 rushing yards a game here, which really kind of fits into what Philadelphia did last week. And if you believe in returning to the norm, probably won't do this week. They won't sniff 363 yards in this game, folks. I can guarantee you that, especially against this Tennessee rush defense. Uh, like Victor mentions, they're probably going to attack that Tennessee secondary as opposed to trying to pound the ball on the ground. <clears throat> My biggest concern for Tennessee, though, has been their inability to outgain opponents this season here. They've only won the stats in two of their 11 football games, but that's been their 
uh, MO all season long, if you will. They kind of get pushed around the field but still find ways to win football games. Uh, the reason they do that is because of their head coach, Mike Vrabel, who's a terrific head coach. It, uh, the proof is in the pudding. Just check out their record and what they've been before he was a head coach and what he is right now. They're 4-0 to the spread. Tennessee is when both teams are coming off non-division games. And the Titans don't figure to beat themselves in this football game. This is another Mike Vrabel trait. You take a look in their last eight football games, they've turned the ball over only five times Have the Tennessee Titans. You don't get these unexpected scores going against them here. What I like most about the game is Mike Vrabel, as I mentioned before. Off a loss in his career with the Titans, he has 15-10-1 to the spread. He's also 7-2 and two straight up and 6-3 and three to the spread when he takes on an 800 or better opponent. That's what I said. The better the opponent, the better Mike Vrabel's Tennessee Titans are. 7-2 and two straight up, 6-3 and three to the spread, spread against 800 or better opponents, and 6-1 and one to the spread as a dog in this role. Give me the Tennessee Titans plus the points for my side in this football game. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. And with that, let's talk about the Las Vegas for one of our favorite segments as we visit in with our good friend Andy Isco joining us from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. Andy, how is everything going for you and in Vegas these days? Well, Mark and Victor, uh, everything is going well. And I thought that was a brilliant analysis, both side and total on that Philadelphia-Tennessee game. A couple of things that I could just add uh, to further the analysis. Uh, Tennessee's losses this year, other than the blowout loss at Buffalo, uh, was a three-point loss uh, earlier in the year, a three-point overtime loss at Kansas City, and a four-point uh, loss last week at uh, uh, Cincinnati. And the, the brilliant thing that uh, I liked from uh, Victor was that record about uh, uh, NFC home favorites, the 11-3 and three to the over. Consider that for the year, the league as a whole – using the numbers that I use, which are the closing numbers at the uh, Westgate, 78 overs, 100 unders, wow. and two pushes, which means that in a season in which the league is 22 net games under the total, Victor's got uh, a point there with a situation that is eight games net to the over. Good stuff, Andy. Yeah, real good stuff. There's Andy Isco from Las Vegas. That's why he's our guru. <laughs> Great job, Andy. We love hearing stuff just like that. And I got to ask you, how are things going for you in Las Vegas these days? And uh, also, how much of that turkey did you actually eat or did you throw out last week? That's the over-under we want to know, Andy. Uh, let's see. One full helping on Thanksgiving Day, two three-quarters helpings on Friday and Saturday. Finish it off on Sunday. That makes it uh, two and a half plus whatever there was on Sunday. So we'll right. and, and then went into withdrawal, so I had to have it again on Tuesday after missing Monday. Oh, my. There we go. <laughs> Life in Las Vegas, I guess, <laughs> from somebody who really, really, really appreciates Thanksgiving Day, as we all do. Andy, let's take a look at those contests in Las Vegas. I know we missed last week's show, and I know our listeners would love to know what's the current update status going on with the th major contests that are going on in Vegas this season? Well, first of all, there are a lot of things that we all have uh, uh, reasons to be thankful for. Uh, one reason I didn't want to be thankful for is that last week's NFL week uh, existed because it was not a good week after a really good season. But the good, the the, the positive aspect is that it is usually, and we see it in teams as well. After a bad week, you very often, more often than not, rebound with a good week. Now, as far as the contestants, I'll talk about uh, folks who had a bad week uh, in the Westgate consensus. Uh, last week, uh, there were five top selections. Now, one of them did involve uh, the Bengals and the Titans who played each other. So you had to get a one one out of that. But the other three selections, the Seattle, uh, the Seahawks, the Chargers and the Falcons uh, comprise the balance of the top five. Uh, they all lost against the spread. So one in four for the week brings the Westgate Super Contest uh, consensus through 12 weeks, two thirds of the season to 33, 26 and one. And that's uh, a shade under 56 percent, 55.8 percent, which is one of the weaker records we've seen over the last few years, especially as the field has grown uh, more sophisticated and larger uh, through uh, 12 weeks. There are two contestants tied at the top of the uh, Super Contest. Uh, it's hitting 70.8%. That's 42.5 out of a possible 60 points. Another contestant is at 70%, two more at 67.5%, and the contest pays down to uh, 30 places in ties. There are 13 contestants tied for the uh, uh, the last, I think it's the last four uh, uh, 
uh, paying places. They are hitting 64.2%. So that's the number to keep in mind when you're talking about right now, what is it taking to be in the money in cash? Of course, in the Super Contest Gold, the $5,000 winner take all, there's only going to be one winner. And that person will take home a total of $400,000 with 80 entries. There's one contestant with a quote unquote, even the two thirds of the way through the season, a three and a half game lead. 43 out of a possible 60 points. That's 71.7%. And that's good enough for a lead over one contestant at 65.8%, three and a half points back. Uh, finally, for this part of the contest, uh, before we get to Circa, the Golden Nugget, which is the contest that combines college and pro. And of course, over the next few weeks, it's going to be mostly pro football selections as we wind up the college, the large part of the college season with the uh, conference championship games this weekend. And then we go over the next few weeks where there will be a smattering of bowl games over the final few weeks of the contest that'll end, I believe it's the second uh, weekend in January. So uh, those uh, who have been concentrating on college football uh, will uh, be boning up more on the NFL. And uh, those who have been playing the NFL for a good part of the season probably have a bit of an advantage if they've been doing that. I don't, don't have the breakdown of who's played college and who's played pro, but I can tell you there is one contestant who leads the pack 55 out of a possible 84 points. That's 65.5%. Uh, they make seven selections a week as opposed to five in the Westgate and Circa contest. That's good for a two and a half point lead over one contestant in second. Right now to be, con to be cashing in this contest, which pays uh, the top 20 places and ties, you need to be hitting 56 and a half percent. That's a percentage that's really attainable. And it does tell me that a lot of the folks have been struggling. And I would guess to say a lot of it in college football this year, because these percentages are usually higher, uh, even at this late stage uh, of the season. And it's uh, it's well spread out, but still uh, we've got uh, six weeks remaining in uh, in all these uh, major football contests as we've gotten through uh, week 12. Now, turning to the survivor, and that's the uh, $1,000 entry fee. You pick one game a week has to win straight up. Uh, you cannot use a team more than once. Thanksgiving week is one of two weeks during the season uh, that is split into two components. Christmas uh, weekend will be the next, so there'll be 20 weeks over the 18-week NFL season. Going into week 12, uh, which is uh, Thanksgiving weekend, there were 74 contestants who still had, or 74 entries, I should say, uh, that were still alive. Uh, probably not 74 individuals, but 74 entries. On Thursday, uh, the uh, uh, the contest, uh, you had to make a selection on one of those six teams that played Thanksgiving Day. Three uh, three of them advanced, uh, three of the uh, four teams that were picked, the Bills, Cowboys, and Vikings all won. So 71 contestants out of the 74 advanced. Three were eliminated uh, with the Patriots, uh, who, of course, lost to Minnesota. And, of course, with four teams being selected, we knew that at least one uh, team was going to lose. So we'd have some uh, 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 eliminated. And then on the Sunday, Monday, the second part of this week, uh, which is actually week 13 for the contest, which is the end of week 12 for uh, the NFL schedule. Uh, five teams were picked, Dolphins, Jets, 49ers, Commanders, and Chiefs. All five of those won their game straight up on a Sunday. Uh, that meant the 71 who survived Thursday also survived uh, the end of the week. Entries remaining 71, that's 1.16%. Over over 90, almost 99 percent of the entries have been eliminated. And this compares to last year, where actually last year there were only 0.69 percent remaining after Thanksgiving week. If you remember, Dallas, which was a popular pick last year, lost at home on right. Thanksgiving Day. And uh, there were 4,080 entries. Only 28 remained uh, alive. So after all year having a great domination compared to last year, last year is actually now outperforming this year, both uh, well in terms of percentage. However, 71 remain alive because of the larger field, only 28 alive last year. And of course, last year, we ended up with five people going the full 20 contest weeks. Perfect. Uh, still don't know if uh, 71 will do it this year, but certainly compared to last year, they're in good position to do so now. That's uh, really a nice, stunning number, Andy, uh, because of uh, what had happened early on in the Survivor Contest with so many people dumping early on in the contest and the pool getting just drastically cut back early on. Now, suddenly, last year is outpacing this year. It's rather stunning. I guess that's what happens when Dallas loses on Thanksgiving Day. And when they win on Thanksgiving Day this year. 
Exactly. Because they were, uh, you know, you had the Lions who were playing well, and they gave Buffalo a, a run. I, I was surprised that, well, maybe not all that, that uh, uh, that we saw that distribution. I think uh, go back and see, just as a moment. Uh, yeah, the Bills were the most popular sh- uh, selection. I was surprised it was that big of a margin over the uh, the Cowboys, who were playing the Giants and whom they had beaten earlier in the year. And the Giants uh, were not in the best of form coming into that game, but. Uh, did well enough to cover the spread at the very end, but it's going to be an exciting final six weeks, actually five, five league weeks um, and six contest weeks, because you've got the uh, Christmas Eve, Thursday and Christmas Eve. And uh, th- I think it's Thursday. And I think there may be a game on Friday. I don't recall, but then you've got, I think uh, uh, maybe it's Thursday and Saturday, which is the bulk of the schedule. And I think there are three games on Sunday and maybe one on Monday or something. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as we near the end of the contest. Yeah, especially with people having used their Buffalo and Dallas bullets this Thanksgiving weekend, they won't have them come Christmas. So, which it will brings make- up an interesting point. And if you go on the Circa website, they will actually show you what the distribution is of the contests who still remain. So you can actually go in there if you if you're curious enough and want to, you can see who still has Buffalo alive, who still has Dallas, Kansas City alive, or what teams the remaining contestants have, and for them to make it through the 20 weeks. Uh, be interesting to see which six of those cont- which which six teams those contestants have. As I say, I don't know if the gaming commission allows it, but it'd be interesting because you have the ability to do that analysis, that handicapping of the remaining field. That they could put up, uh, you know, will anyone go unbeaten? How many will it be, etc. But uh, that may be a thought for another year. Well, we'll talk about that with the circa folks during the off season. Sounds like a great idea. We're visiting with Andy Esco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas, publisher of one of the finest football newsletters in the nation. I encourage you to put a copy in front of yourself in time for the football games this weekend. Log on at TheLogicalApproach.com for details today. Andy, as we always do, let's take a look now at the advanced look-ahead lines of what we're looking at on the National Football League side of things based upon what they were before the season began and what the Superbook sent out last week, if you will. Yeah, actually, there are three time frames, well, four time frames, I guess, technically. We look at what uh, you put in, uh, or numbers close to what you put in the uh, playbook annual, which are uh, advanced lines that the Westgate put out for all 18 weeks back over, I think, in early to mid-July. Right. Then we uh, then the, the second point is the 10-day advance line, Tuesday before the week preceding these games, meaning that uh, the lines that I'll mention will have been put out uh, a week ago uh, the other day, Tuesday, which was before the playing of the Thanksgiving Day and Thanksgiving Week games, then the reposted lines late Sunday afternoon and any significant movement. So uh, the first one I'll look at is the Bills and Patriots. Over the summer, the Bills were th- only a three-point road favorite at New England, despite the fact that uh, uh, d- despite the fact that the Patriots were expected to really struggle and the Bills were expected to be the dominating team in the NFL. Uh, Bills, Bills have not been as dominating as they were early, but the Patriots have played better than expected. Yet the uh, two-week advance line or the 10-day advance line, Bills favored by five. And after Sunday's action, they actually were reopened at five and a half. But as we record this podcast uh, Wednesday afternoon, Bills down to three and a half point road favorites. So really not much different from where they were back in the summer, despite, despite the fact that they were higher just a few days ago. Uh, Pittsburgh, a a two-and-a-half-point road favorite at Atlanta over the summer. The advance line uh, had the favorites change slightly with the Falcons a one-point favorite. They opened a one-point favorite, but the money early this week has come in and flipped it. Pittsburgh now a two-point road favorite. This next one is a little bit interesting, but also understandable. Over the summer, there was a lot of hype about the Denver Broncos being one of the teams to keep an eye on. Uh, Baltimore is expected to be a contender. Uh, they almost always are under John Harbaugh. So the over the over the summer line had the Ravens just three point home favorites. Well, Baltimore has played well, though not outstanding. Denver has really struggled. So the 10 day advance line had the Ravens up from three still to six and a half. It was reposted at seven and a half. And, uh, Currently, money has come in on the Ravens. They are a nine-point home favorite over a team that, uh, I, Victor knows the exact numbers, but Denver games average somewhere in the, uh, what, low to mid-30s. What, uh, 34.5. Yeah, and that's now 12 games in, or 11 games into the season. Uh, the Green Bay Packers, to show you how far they've fallen over the summer, seven-point road favorites over uh, the uh 
the homestanding Bears. Even 10 days ago, the Packers were down to two and a half point road favorites. After Sunday's results, the Packers were reinstalled over a field goal, four point road favorites. They're currently up to four and a half at Chicago. Uh, the status of Aaron Rodgers, of course, still uh, uncertain. Uh, another one that is worth noting Cleveland, a seven point summertime favorite at Houston. Uh, despite the problems that Houston is having, Browns have not played up to expectations. They opened two weeks ago or 10 days ago, four and a half point road, road favorites, reinstalled Sunday, six and a half point uh, favorites after their win over Tampa Bay, currently bet up to summer, uh, to, uh, to seven rather. Uh, Minnesota, seven point home favorite over the summer against the Jets, who nobody gave much of a chance. Jets have played extremely well, as have the Vikings. So the 10 day advance line down uh, almost five points. Vikings, two and a half point favorites. Opened again Sunday evening at three and a half. They are down to three. Uh, Eagles, just one and a half point summertime favorites over the uh, visiting Tennessee Titans. Of course, Tennessee's on that great covering streak or had been until uh, their loss at Cincinnati. Eagles have been the best team in football this season. Eagles opened up a seven point 10 day advance favorite, reopened at six and a half. And for many reasons, I imagine that you and Victor discussed, they are currently five and a half. Uh, one of the biggest all-time changes, and I don't think we may ever see this again, the Rams, 10.5-point home favorites over Seattle over the summer. Not only did they change more than a touchdown in the 10-day advance line, it was nearly two touchdowns. From minus 10.5, the Rams are now plus three. Seattle, a three-point home favorite. After Sunday's action with the Rams, uh, with their backup backup quarterback losing uh, Kansas City, Seattle now a four opened a four and a half point favorite. They've been up to seven and a half. I don't know that we will ever again see an 18 point difference between a team, uh, their line over the summer and where they are as we approach game day. But that is uh, pretty astounding. Just a couple of others. Raiders open pick over the summer. Chargers three on the 10 day advance line. Then two and a half on the repost, down to one and a half. And the Sunday night game, Dallas, another significant move. Three at home over Indianapolis over the summer. Colts expected to be an AFC South contender. On the 10 uh, day advance line, Cowboys nine and a half, reposted at nine and a half, and uh, currently up to 11. So a lot of movement, as we would expect, a lot of movement between the summertime line. And the 10-day advance line, you know, 12 weeks into the season, but also considerable movement between the 10-day advance line to where we are now with just one game having been played for all those teams in between the 10-day line and the current line. Andy Isco with our NFL spread stock market numbers on all the National Football League games on tap this weekend. And Andy, I'm with you. I scratch my head and wonder, how could we have ever seen a two-touchdown swing in a game from the beginning of the season until the game kicks off this particular week. But it's what happens when you fall uh, to injuries as the LA Rams have. And the key word there is backup, backup quarterback. Well, uh, the, the one thing also is we always preach, don't overreact, but don't fail to react. It used to be in the past that the lines makers would take longer to react, which is what we preach. Uh, but more, nowadays, with the wealth of information out there, the sophistication and the size of the betting markets, even the lines makers are quick to make adjustments, taking away another edge that a lot of veteran handicappers and bettors have had for literally decades because they were a lot quicker to react, but not as much as expected. But now the lines makers are somewhat keeping pace with quicker reactions. Yeah, we're seeing it, especially with teams like the L.A. Rams this football season and other teams that have been vastly disappointing this year and probably going to continue to see with the Rams because I don't see any progress or hope inside for the Rams this football season. We're visiting with Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas as we get the Vegas vibe on what's going on this weekend in college and National Football League. And Andy, before we let you go, I know our listeners would love to know what you're looking at for your complimentary play this week. Sure, Mark. There are a lot of really attractive matchups on uh, this week's card, one of which is uh, I know one of the games that, that you like to look for, playoff revenge games from last year, and none bigger perhaps than Kansas City against Cincinnati. 
this week. Uh, for a second straight week, the Bengals uh, face a team that they eliminated from last year's playoffs on the way to their Super Bowl loss to the Rams. Uh, both of those playoff wins uh, on the road. Now, last week, they got the first win of this two-game uh, back-to-back set by holding off Tennessee with their 20-16 to uh, uh, road win last week. And now this week, they finally play one of these playoff uh, teams uh, at home in facing Kansas City. Double revenge for the Chiefs, who actually lost on this field late last season by a field goal. And then, of course, uh, in the playoffs, they lost to the Chiefs again uh, by a field goal. A game could have playoff implications for home field. Kansas City 9-2, and two, Cincinnati 7-4. and four. Uh, so Cincinnati, and, uh, if Kansas City wins, they distance themselves with a, uh, a three-game advantage. If they lose, they're just one game ahead of Cincinnati, but the Bengals would have the tiebreaker. So a little bit more for Kansas City to give us a fully uh, focused effort in this game. A wide receiver chase uh, is expected back for this game for the Bengals. The status of running back Mixon remains uh, questionable. Uh, Chiefs have solid edges uh, on offense, both in cover and uh, both in the running and the passing games, uh, despite the uh, the notoriety of Joe, Joe Burrow, who's having a fine season. But I, I like to look at pass completion uh, numbers, and the defensive stats uh, are fairly even. With Kansas City actually allowing uh, per pass completion one lar- one yard less than the Bengals allow, which might come, some, come as a surprise. The Bengals can't put uh, some pressure, but uh, the Chiefs have played very well. Uh, Bengals have the confidence uh, that they can win this game, and they've actually won three straight and five of six as they return home after those after a pair of road wins. Kansas City's won five straight and seven and eight. In the current streak, uh, streak of three, uh, in, in the current streak of uh, their five straight wins, three have been by double digits. And the other two each by a field goal. They're laying two and a half in this game, so we do have a little bit of um, of, uh, of room here. Kansas City and Mahomes, uh, the quarterback, have generally been at their best in the big games. And with the Bengals a possible playoff opponent, the Chiefs could play one more of their best games of the season after a pair of close losses last season uh, to the uh, Bengals. Don't expect a blowout. But I'm calling for a seven to ten point win for uh, Kansas City, where they cover the number and the game. Uh, well, I guess by the final score that I have stays under the total. And he likes the Chiefs to get their revenge this week against the Cincinnati Bengals, who, as he mentioned, held off Tennessee last week. He doesn't see him doing it two weeks in a row. Andy, once again, a great job on the show as always this week. A lot of really good information that uh, we'll savor as we look look forward to this weekend's football card. I'll look forward to visiting with you next week here on Mark Lawrence Against the Spread. I wish you nothing but the very best of luck this week. Thanks, Mark. And uh, you, Victor, and all the listeners and viewers have a, a, a great, successful uh, weekend while I go out and look for some more turkey. There we go. Look out. Andy's <laughs> on the run right now. <laughs> that was Andy Isco joining us from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. And, guys, before we get to my awesome angle of the weekend, complimentary plays from Victor and myself. We've got a complimentary play from our good friend Jim Feist with his complimentary video pick for this particular week. Jim, take it away if you would. Hi, guys. Hi, Mark. This is championship weekend for a lot of divisions. I'm going to take a look at the MAC, Ohio against Toledo. They're playing this in Detroit, Fort Field. Toledo's open to three and a half point favorite. Now, you might question that because Ohio's on an eight-game cover streak and Toledo's lost their last five against the number. Now, there's injuries on both sides. Ohio will be without their starting quarterback, but the backup last week did pass for almost 200 yards, and they did run the ball pretty well. Ohio's defense is very strong. They haven't given up a running game over 100 yards in quite a while. Now, their defense against the pass isn't that strong, but I don't know that we're going to see much from Toledo. Now, going back to the line move here, Toledo opened three and a half points in favorite, and now it's two and a lot of one and a half, so I expect to see even lower. I'm going to go with the movement here. I like Ohio. I like their momentum. They haven't won this championship since 68 long before most of you were born. But I like Ohio to bounce back here from all the times they've gone there and not won it. It's a battle for Ohio between Toledo and Ohio. Now, 
One of them is going to do a lot better than Ohio State did last week. So there you have it. Ohio plus the point or two. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jim. Much appreciated and best of luck to you this week. Remember, you can check out all of Jim Feist's complimentary videos on the PlaybookSports.com website for complimentary NFL and college plays from Jim Feist, the living legend. Now let's move over to my awesome angle of the week in this week's football card in the National Football League. We call it Rush to Victory. And what we're looking to do is to play on any NFL division dog who rushes the ball for more than five yards of carry and they're taking on an opponent, a division opponent, who allows more than five yards of carry. These are these division five-by-five five dogs that we talk about a lot on the show. We're doing that because since 1997, these division dogs in this five-by-five five role are 10-2-2 two, and two against the spread. That's an 82% winning angle. We'll be playing on the Las Vegas Raiders this particular week for our awesome angle play on the football show this week. And with that, let's hand it over to Victor King from King Creole Sports for his complimentary play as well. And Victor, if you would, let our listeners know what you've got on tap this week as well. Sure thing, Mark. First off, uh, we can't forget all about our playbook publications. That would be the Total's Tip Sheet newsletter, the Midweek Alert newsletter, and the Playbook newsletter. Hot publications. You can get the three for a quarter promotion at playbooksports.com, all three of this week's newsletters for just $25. Uh, what we have planned this week in college football on Saturday, we've got one under and one over. Both will be available, uh, oh, by sometime Thursday evening. And in the NFL, we've got a... What looks like it's going to be a five-game totals ticket. That'll be available also at the PlaybookSports.com website. Our top five NFL over-unders for Sunday. And for our free play this week, we are going to give the ball once again to King's best friend. And that would be our boy Tuco, who's off a winner last week as he had a Turkey Day team total selection on the Dallas Cowboys to score over 27 and a half points. They uh, did bring home the bacon by just one uh, point in that particular game, but we'll take it. Tuco is off a winner, and he's uh, heading to one of his favorite cities this week, and that would be Sin City. And he's going to have some action in the Raiders-Chargers game. That would be the Raiders team that Mark just mentioned in his awesome angle play. And Tuco's also going to join the Raiders this week as he plays on Las Vegas to go over their team total of 24 points against the L.A. Chargers. And why not the Raiders? As we mentioned at the top of the show, they're off their best offensive performance of the entire season, 576 yards last week, 40 points against the Seahawks. And they will be back at home in the friendly confines of Allegiant Stadium, where they have already averaged 28.3 points per game on the season. And not only that, but at home against all conference foes in the last two years, these games have gone 12 overs and only two unders. And you know, Mark, not only that, but uh, Vegas is a very favorable matchup this week as they will be facing a bottom six defense in the Chargers a team that's already allowing 28.0 points per game on the season. And not only that, but big time rushing advantage for the Raiders in this game. They average 5.2 yards per rush. The Chargers allow 5.4 yards per rush on defense. That is dead last in the league. It's basically telling us that uh, the Raiders will be able to do anything they want on offense. You want to run the ball, you want to pass the ball. They should have success. Uh, based on those rushing numbers, in the last two years, game three or greater home teams who average five or more yards per rush have scored 29.2 points per game against any opponent that allows five or more yards per rush, like the Chargers. Uh, last week, the Raiders ran the ball right down Seattle's throat, 283 rushing yards. NFL teams who rushed for 275 or more on the road in their previous week have averaged 30.5 points per game in the last 15 years. 
Again, we're giving the ball to Tuco, and his team total of the week is on the Raiders to score over 24 points in their home game against the Chargers. Uh, with that said, we'll throw it back to Mark. And Mark, the way that you have been taking no prisoners with these four-star best bets over the last four weeks, it could very well be a December to remember, huh? Well, it could well be a December to remember, Victor. Thanks for the lead in there. Before I get to that, I want to run this one by you here, and I'm sure you came across this somewhere, but I have to figure the bad beat of the season in the National Football League occurred last week on the Miami Dolphin team total. It was 30 and a half, the Dolphins team total in their football game last week against Houston. They led 30 to nothing at the half. They ended up winning 30 to 15. They didn't score a point in the second half. You're sitting there with a total over 30 and a half. You've got 30 at the half. You're figuring, how, where am I going to dinner tonight? Uh, you know, what am I going to spend this money? <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's uh-oh, refund time. That had to be a bad, bad beat. I don't know if you were involved in it or you saw that, but I want to pass that on. No, I didn't want any action in that game whatsoever, and with good reason, Mark. It's a very, very good point. This is what you get when you run into a 14-point, uh, two-touchdown home favorite in regards to game flow or game script. In this scenario, the double-digit favorite is usually up by double digits at half, they try to shorten that game in the second half, make it go as fast as possible with all the running plays that Miami ran in the second half of that particular game. Uh, I can I can see that it was definitely a bad beat, but it was probably a smart play not to play the Dolphins over their team total, given the fact that they would have a very slow game script in the second half. But when they pulled all the starters midway through the third quarter, you had to think, uh-oh, what's going to happen here? How, right. how how ugly can this turn out? And it certainly turned out ugly. Good point on your part, though, about big favorites going over team totals. Yep. Very good. Okay, Victor, you mentioned about what's on tap for December here. It couldn't be a better time of the year for yours truly right now. Not only are we on this great 7-0 run on our big 4, 5, and 10-star plays of late here, it's double 10-star December from our preferred picks executive late phone football service. And last year... If you are with me, you remember the Sports Monitor documented it all. We went ten, or we, sorry, we went sixteen and three on all of our football plays throughout the month of December. That was probably the best month we've ever had. Sixteen and three in December. It included our ten star NFL, our ten star College Bowl, our five star College Bowl. Just about everything we touched won. We had a net profit of over fifty three hundred dollars for double ten star December last year. It kicks off this weekend, guys. Included will be this weekend's College Football Conference Championship Play of the Year. We've won this game eight out of nine years documented since we've been doing it. We've got another live dog, I'll tell you that, no surprise to anybody out there, on this College Conference Championship card for our featured championship play of the year. You can get it one of two ways, a $79 weekend of winners for all of my college football and NFL plays this weekend, or better yet, join me now for double 10-star December Get every college and pro football release I make with all the bowl games, and we even throw in the college bowl stat report as a no-charge bonus. It's just $399 complete. That's less than the cost of one four-star winner alone. You can log on now at playbooksports.com or give our office a call toll-free for double 10-star December at 1-800-321-7777. With that, guys, let's get over to my complimentary play on the football card this week. And uh, once again, I want to thank everybody that sent all their condolences into us with the passing of my sister two weeks ago. It was very, very memorable, and we dedicated that show to her, and she'll continue to live in our hearts forever. Our complimentary play on the football card this week, we're going to the National Football League side of things and take a look at those Pittsburgh Steelers who are quietly coming on right now at the right time of the season. Since T.J. Watt has come back into the lineup, Pittsburgh has won two of their three football games. They're suddenly 4-7 and seven on the season. And now Mike Tomlin has a chance to keep his winning record alive. If they can continue this run, beat teams like Atlanta this particular week, they can be in a nice position to do just that down the stretch in December. The Steelers have won the money seven straight times in a row against teams out of the NFC South. They're also a perfect 6-0 to the number after taking on the Indianapolis Colts. Take a look at the Atlanta Falcons, one of the phoniest 
in the stats teams in the National Football League. They're one and nine to the spread their last 10 games against teams out of the AFC North, a nice collision of two division conference patterns in the same football game. Atlanta also one and six to the spread off of a loss when they're a pick or dog. This game's a pick them right now as we're speaking. I got a feeling it's going to go to favorite. Andy mentioned that earlier on in the show. Stay with the Pittsburgh Steelers here, guys, for my complimentary play. I think they're playing to win one for the Gipper for Mike Tomlin on out. T.J. Watts leading the charge. We'll make the Pittsburgh Steelers our complimentary play on Sunday's pro football card. That's going to put the final wraps on this edition of Mark Lawrence Against the Spread. I want to thank our co-host Victor King from King Creole Sports for a great job on the show. Our good friend Andy Isco joining us from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. And until next week, once again, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always.